the subject of today's session is one of the most crucial transformations that takes place not only in the Torah, not only in the Bible, but arguably in all of history. It's something that is first discussed in detail in Exodus chapter 25. It is the establishment of a sacred, special place. The basis of every house of worship that existed not only in the Bible, but to this very day. Inevitably, our major challenge is, what's its purpose? What does it mean? What does it do? Obviously, many issues. We'll attempt to, in the time that we have, at least address some of them. First, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 25, where we read about the commandment to make this sacred space. Beginning with the beginning of the chapter. And God spoke unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the people of Israel that they take for me an offering of every man whose heart impels him to generosity. You shall take my offering. And what follows, not included here for reasons of repetition, is a list of all of the ingredients, all of the media, all the substances that will be brought as contributions to this project. At the end of which, we read in verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Note the anomaly. We might have thought, after having spent the last several verses outlining the construction project, that the conclusion would be, let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell in it. But of course, that's not the case. Nor, indeed, could it possibly be the case, as we know very well, and as indeed is expressed explicitly by King Solomon in his prayer of dedication of the temple. We'll be returning to this shortly, but in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verse 27, will God in very truth dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. So the dwelling place is obviously not intended as a place in which God dwells, but which of course, if anything, just exacerbates our problem. So if the obvious, admittedly childish answer that the sanctuary is where God lives is manifestly untrue, what is its purpose? In attempting to address this question, a good place to start is the context. Obviously, Exodus chapter 25 comes immediately after Exodus chapter 24. Now, Exodus chapter 24 describes the second phase, the conclusion of the revelation at Sinai, the theophany. At the end of this process of divine revelation, Moses is summoned back up the mountain. And it's significant for us to note what we read as the description of this charge given to Moses, in particular, to compare what we read in Exodus chapter 24 with what is inevitably the conclusion of the construction process in producing the tabernacle, the sanctuary, that begins here in chapter 25 and is completed at the end of the book of Exodus in chapter 40. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 15, and Moses went up into the mount and the cloud covered the mount. One can't help but note, in Exodus chapter 40, 
in verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The glory of God filled the tabernacle. Well, in chapter 24, verse 16, and the glory of God abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. In verse 17 as well, we read about the appearance of the glory of God. Well, indeed, in verse 35, once again we read, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. If anything, the crucial difference between these two passages is that while the theme of the glory of God appears in both, the cloud appears in both. Moreover, the fire appears in both. In chapter 24, verse 17, the appearance of the glory of God was like a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the sight of the people of Israel. And in chapter 40, we read about the fire in the very last verse of Exodus. In verse 38, the cloud of God was upon the tabernacle by day and there was fire therein by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So all the motifs seem so similar, except the last two words in Exodus in the Hebrew. In the English translation here, it's the last four words of verse 38, highlight precisely where the difference lies and provide us with a first insight into what the purpose of the tabernacle is altogether. In chapter 24, we read of the one-time revelation of God at Sinai. In chapter 40, we read about something that accompanies the people of Israel throughout all their journeys. That is, the role of Mount Sinai as a focal point in our experiencing God's revelation in the world. Indeed, our experiencing in the sight of all the people of Israel is to be fulfilled and perpetuated in the sight of all the house of Israel on an ongoing basis throughout all their journeys. And of course, this is a crucial difference because as we read in Exodus chapter 19, while indeed the intensity of God's revelation at Sinai was totally unprecedented. In chapter 19, verse 9, God says to Moses, Lo, I come unto you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you, all the people, and may also believe in you forever. And in the continuation in verse 11, we read that on the third day, God will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And by consequence of that revelation, the intensity of the sanctity of the mountain is such, in the following verse, in verse 12, we read the warning, take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount, nor touch the border of it. The consequences may literally be deadly while all that is the case, the extraordinary intensity of God's revelation at Sinai, it's all so fleeting. The very next verse, verse 13, in amplifying the warning, concludes when the ram's horn sounds long, they may come up to the mountain. At the final extended blast, of the ram's horn, of the shofar, which indicates that God's presence is 
no longer manifest at Sinai, no problem. Mount Sinai becomes just another mountain in the wilderness. What do we know about Mount Sinai today? Well, there is a mountain in the Sinai Peninsula called in Arabic, Jebel Musa, which translates to Moses's mountain. There, a monastery is located called Santa Caterina that reportedly commemorates the mountain of the revelation. What evidence do we have that that mountain is the actual Mount Sinai? Sent to report, virtually nothing. If anything, the reason for identifying that peak as Mount Sinai, an identification that, to the best of my knowledge, has no antecedent before the medieval period, was because it's the tallest peak in the area. Well, we have an ancient tradition that Mount Sinai was not a very tall peak because typically in the ancient world, all the tall peaks had been made into idolatrous shrines. Sinai signifies humility. It isn't a tall peak. And there was no idolatrous shrine upon it. And so, Jebel Musa is just another mountain. Mount Sinai remains elusive, as it should be. Because, after all, after that blast of the ram's horn, Mount Sinai is nothing special. It's important for us to appreciate that for the time of the divine revelation, Mount Sinai was what it was, but not beyond that. And that's precisely what makes those last two words in Exodus. In the English, again, the last four words, throughout all their journeys, so significant. Mount Sinai would be a one-time affair, whereas the sanctuary, the tabernacle, accompanies the people throughout all their journeys. And indeed, while for the duration of the revelation at Sinai, Moses communes with the divine presence by climbing up the mountain, as we saw, for example, in chapter 24, verse 15, Moses went up into the mountain. What's the vehicle of communing with God after the tabernacle is built. It's not climbing up the mountain anymore, is it? Indeed, in the continuation of Exodus chapter 25, when we read of the construction of the ark and the ark cover, and in verse 21, you shall put the ark cover above upon the ark, in the ark, you shall put the testimony that I shall give you, the tablets, in verse 22, and there I will meet with you, not on the mountain. And I will speak with you from above the ark cover, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. Now, there's a very important point for us to appreciate in the interim before we even continue. And that is, let there be no mistake about this. God is not on Mount Sinai. God is not in the tabernacle either. To employ a loose analogy that might help make the role of the mountain and the tabernacle clearer, consider radio waves. We know that for all intents and purposes, radio waves fill all space, but it doesn't make a difference to us. If you don't have a radio that is working, that is plugged in, and that is properly tuned, 
you're not going to hear the radio broadcast. The radio waves may be everywhere, but you need a special mechanism to be able to connect with them. You don't change the radio waves. You change your ability to connect. And of course, inevitably, the same is true here. It's a loose analogy because, well, radio waves are still part of the physical world. They may exist in all space, but they're still confined to space. God is beyond space, just as he's beyond time. God created, after all, both space and time and transcends them both. But in order for us to be able to connect with God's presence, we need the right mechanism. At the time of the revelation at Sinai, it was the mountain. But that was a one-time basis. Afterward, it becomes the tabernacle. Hence, again, all the parallels that we note between chapter 24 with respect to the mountain and chapter 40 with respect to the tabernacle. Both are means through which we connect. We connect with the cloud, with the fire, and most of all, with the glory of God. That glory that enables us to sense the imminence of God's presence. Now, you might conclude that there is nonetheless a crucial lack of symmetry between chapter 24 and chapter 40 because after all in chapter 24 verse 16 while we read that there is an initial period the glory of god abode upon mount sinai and the cloud covered it six days afterward the seventh day God called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and Moses enters the cloud. Whereas in Exodus chapter 40, for all appearances, all we read is that Moses was not able to enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. So where's the symmetry? The problem isn't the lack of symmetry. Maybe it's a lack of patience. We need to bear in mind, after all, that these verses conclude the book of Exodus. What happened after the book of Exodus? Of course, the beginning of Leviticus. And the very first verse of Leviticus is, and God called unto Moses and spoke unto him out of the tent of meeting. That is, Moses is indeed summoned. So the entire apparatus is means to take what Mount Sinai signified on a one-time basis and make something that will perpetuate it in all their journeys. Except it's important for us to appreciate that the tabernacle still is not real permanence. The Holy Temple is only when you come to Jerusalem do we indeed attain that permanence. And that's precisely what we read in the dedication of the Holy Temple in the first book of Kings in chapter 8. Beginning in verse 6, and the priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of God unto its place into the sanctuary of the house to the most holy place even under the wings of the cherubim. And in verse 10, very much apropos of what we already saw in Exodus chapter 24 with respect to the mountain and chapter 40 with respect to the tabernacle. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of God so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud for the glory of God filled the house of God. The glory of God that abode upon the mountain that filled the tabernacle, now with permanence, is manifest at the site of the Holy Temple, which 
occasions then, the words of King Solomon in his prayer of dedication of the Holy Temple, beginning in verse 12. God has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built you a house of habitation, a place for you to dwell in forever. A place for you to dwell in? Did King Solomon think that God would dwell in a physical structure? Manifestly not. We already noted, verse 27, but will God in very truth dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Of course, we stress, we stress in verse 27 and in all of the references to heaven that we find in subsequent verses, that when King Solomon speaks of heaven, he's obviously not referring to up there. Because up there is still space. He means a spiritual realm, a non-physical realm. God transcends the bounds of physicality. And to that extent then, God isn't in the temple. So then what is the temple? We already noted in our analogy to the radio, the means through which we connect. It's not there for God. It's there for us. And it's significant to note in that regard what the content is of King Solomon's prayer of dedication in the balance of chapter 8. Because on the one hand, of course, we appreciate that the temple service, the ceremonies, the rituals that were done inside the temple are a significant component of what happens in the temple. And when we search through the very long prayer of King Solomon for some reference to the ritual, the ceremony of the temple service, it's not there. It's not there at all, not even a single word. What rather is the focus in King Solomon's prayer? Well, first, as noting that it is a prayer, his prayer, and by extension, all prayers, all prayers that connect with God through the temple. And of course, we emphasize through the temple because maybe the most important point to emphasize with respect to the temple is it is not an end in itself. It can only be a means for connecting with God and with godliness. And so when we consider in that light what King Solomon goes on to state, Continuing with verse 28, yet have you turned toward the prayer of your servant and to his supplication, O oh God, my Lord, to hearken unto the song and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day even toward the place whereof you said, my name shall be there, to hearken unto the prayer that your servant shall pray toward this place. Most immediately, he speaks of his own prayer. More generally, he speaks of all prayers. And it is in that vein that we should focus in particular upon the reference to my name, referring, of course, to God, that you said my name shall be there. God's name is a recurrent theme in this prayer, and as we shall see, not only in this prayer, that God's name 
is what, so to speak, indwells in the sanctuary. Now, that in itself is an important point for us to note, because obviously God is not merely his name. What's the significance of a name? The name is not that which is being named, even among people. I am not merely what my name is. What is my name? My name is the way people identify me. My name is how I am recognized, but it's not the essence of what I am. Well, all the more so with respect to God. God's name is the way God is recognized. God's name signifies how we connect with him, but obviously it's not the essence of what God is. And that's precisely the point. The Holy Temple is the place where God's name will be. It's not where God is. Again, God is beyond. But the temple serves as that means for us to connect with his name. And that, again, focuses our attention in particular on the process whereby not only King Solomon, but all of us come to God. Verse 30, hearken you to the supplication of your servant, referring, of course, to his own prayer, and of your people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, yea, hear you in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. So, of course, once again, we accentuate. God isn't described as hearing from the temple, but rather, God hears from heaven, because he's not in the temple. But we connect with God through the temple. Indeed, we can't help but note in emphasizing praying toward this place, that to this very day, Jews everywhere in the world, in turning to God in prayer, turn to the site of the holy temple wherever we are in the world. This is the focal point of prayer. And as the focal point of prayer, the basis for our connecting with God, but the basis for our connecting with God in the context of our deeds, our actions, our worthiness, King Solomon prays that God forgive. But really, ultimately, it's a question of judgment. His judgment. That as we go on to read, for example, in verse 31, if a man sinned against his neighbor. In verse 32, then hear you in heaven and do and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, to bring his way upon his own head, and justifying the righteous, to give him according to his righteousness. This isn't merely about individuals. In verse 33, when your people Israel are smitten down before the enemy, when they do sin against you, if they return again to you and praise your name, again, God's name, in the holy temple, and pray and make supplication unto you in this house, verse 34, then hear you in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back unto the land which you gave unto their fathers. Not merely the individual, indeed, not merely the nation. Because in verse 38, it is any prayer and supplication so ever be made by any man or by all your people Israel, anyone who shall know every man the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house. Verse 39, then hear you in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and do and render unto every man according to all his ways, what he has earned, whose heart you know, for you, even you only, know the hearts of all the children of men, 
And while implicit in verse 38 in speaking of any prayer and supplication so ever be made by any man, is that this refers to everyone in the world, it becomes explicit in verse 41. Moreover, concerning the stranger that is not of your people Israel, when he shall come out of a far land for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and of your strong hand and of your outstretched arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house, hear you in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calls to you for, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name to fear you as do your people Israel, and that they may know that your name is called upon this house that I have built. Note the recurrence over and over again, your name, your great name, over and over. Because again, it is the name that the temple signifies, the means through which we, we, all of humanity, can connect with God's presence at the site of the Holy Temple. Now, we should note an interesting difference between the judgment described in God's reaction to the prayer of the stranger as beseeched by King Solomon here, in particular in verse 43, and what he said earlier on with respect to the prayers in particular of the people of Israel. That is, in verse 43, it was to do according to all that the stranger calls to you for. Whereas in verse 39, you render unto every man according to all his ways, whose heart you know. Give him what he deserves. But we've discussed this elsewhere. With respect to the stranger, the stranger who has not yet had the opportunity to learn about God, King Solomon prays, God, give him whatever he requests, because the stranger first needs to know your great name. They don't know it yet. With respect to Israel, what we call tough love, give them what they deserve. Because again, the temple is not only the focal point of prayer, it's also the focal point of judgment, of evaluating because the temple is never the end, it's a means. And there is this ongoing evaluation. Have we, through the manner in which we are conducting our lives, earned what the temple signifies? This is an ongoing theme that really begins when we get the first inkling of a consecrated sacred space back in Exodus chapter 20. And now in Exodus chapter 20, we aren't reading about the sanctuary, but we do read about the construction of an altar. We read in chapter 20, verse 20, an altar of earth you shall make unto me. In verse 21, it is described as an altar of stone. And it's significant for us to consider the surrounding three verses and their implications with respect to what we need to do in order to earn having this means of connecting with God. In particular, in verse 19, before we read about the altar, we read a prohibition, a warning. You shall not make images of anything that is with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make unto you. And 
with respect to the altar itself, in the continuation of verse 21, there is an explicit prohibition, you shall not build it of hewn, cut stones, lest you lift up your sword upon it, in which case you have profaned it. And one additional prohibition, of which we read in verse 22, neither shall you go up by steps unto my altar that your nakedness be not uncovered thereon. And just to understand what that verse means, if there are steps, then inevitably anyone who climbs the steps will have to splay his legs in order to climb from one step to the next. Now, it isn't literally exposing one's nakedness to the altar to the ground below, because after all, all the priests wore pants. Pants are included in the vestments that are worn by all priests. And yet, still and all, splaying the legs would be considered unseemly, in a way, indecent. And as a result, the altar was not reached by climbing steps, but rather a long ramp. So there would be no need to engage in this immodest or indecent posture on the way up the altar. Consider these three prohibitions again. The prohibition on gods of silver and gods of gold, the prohibition of lifting your sword upon the stones of the altar, and the prohibition of going up steps on the way to the altar because of its indecency. Recall, this may sound in a general sort of way, reminiscent of something that we discussed in the context of our treatment of the Noahide covenant a while ago. The three cardinal sins in the tradition of Israel. The three cardinal sins pertaining to the essential components of life. As we diagram them here, there is, after all, the world inside, the world outside, and the meaning beyond. The world inside is self. The world outside is everyone else. The meaning beyond, beyond both self and others, is God. And corresponding to these three dimensions, with respect to the world inside, self, one of the cardinal sins is a prohibition on sexual immorality. Because sexual immorality is the ultimate debasement of self, making us into mere animals in our behavior. With respect to the pillar of the world outside, our relationship with others, there is the prohibition on murder. Our attitude with respect to other human beings should be giving to them, elevating that relationship. Murder is the ultimate taking away and debasing that relationship. And in our relating to the meaning beyond, to God, the prohibition on idolatry deifying what is not divine. That is, seeing life in terms of an orientation toward divine service, toward harnessing everything as means to a spiritual end. Consider in that light, then, the components of the prohibitions that surround the commandment regarding the altar. Obviously, gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make unto you the prohibition on idolatry. Not lifting a sword over the stones of the altar, the sword symbolizing murder, violence, signifies what would otherwise profane the altar and what is therefore forbidden to be brought over the stones of the altar, and the unseemly exposure 
on the way to the altar corresponds to sexual immorality and the message emergent from it all. If you're going to be making an altar, you need to ensure that you will be worthy of building an altar. You need to ensure that through your conduct, in particular, the way you relate to, as we saw it, those essential components of life, you're worthy of harnessing the altar in particular, the sanctuary in general, as means to the end. The end, the goal, after all, is God and godliness. And that realization helps us to understand the powerful words that we know from the sixth chapter of Micha. In chapter six, beginning in verse six, the prophet repeats, so to speak, the protestation, the question that people ask, wherewith shall I come before God and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves, a year old, temple service? Will God desire thousands of rams with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Maybe on the most revolting plane, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And the response in verse 8, it has been told you, O man, what is good and what God does require of you, but to do justly and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now, when we consider this answer in verse 8, there's an obvious question. Is that really all that God is asking of you? Doesn't seem that way after all. Just read the Torah. Read all the commandments in the words of Moses. God asks of us much, much more than merely doing justly and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. Indeed, when we consider the underlying question, the question of wherewith shall I come before God and bow myself before God on high, that desire to come close to God, there are many commandments that seem to be much more directly related to the process of coming close to God than merely the societal verities of doing justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with God. So why is this the whole list? But perhaps we need to consider what the prophet Micha is saying here by words of dire chastisement of a people who is lost. You think you need to focus upon coming to God, upon being godly? You can only become godly if first you are human. A depraved, corrupt people isn't even acting like human beings. They certainly can't be godly. So says the prophet, you're talking about how am I going to come before God? Let's first talk about who you are, what you are. Are you human? Are you conducting yourselves on the most minimal plane of decency? The most basic thing that God asks of you is to be human. And that means doing justly, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. If you're not doing that, you haven't even begun the process. And this indeed becomes a recurrent theme in the prophets. We could discuss this at very great length, and in other contexts, we've done so in the past, but let's at least briefly focus upon some of the words of the prophets, in particular, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 1, indeed, focuses, beginning in verse 10, on this very issue. Because 
from verse 10, we read God's words of rebuke to a people whom he describes as rulers of Sodom and people of Gomorrah. In verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says God. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I desire not the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. And when you come to appear before me, you're coming into the holy temple. Who wants it? Who has requested this of you to trample my courts? Just stay away. Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. It is an offering of abomination unto me. And even with respect to prayer, in verse 15, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why not? In the Hebrew, a three-word answer. A little bit longer in English. Your hands are full of blood. You're not human. You certainly aren't going to be godly. The temple is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. And that, if anything, is precisely the point that the prophet Jeremiah drums home with even greater force. In Jeremiah chapter 7, we read that God charges the prophet in verse 2, stand in the gate of God's house, the gate of the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of God, all you of Judah, that enter in at these gates, the gates of the holy temple, to prostrate yourselves before God. You think you're trying to be godly. In verse 3, the only way you will do that is amend your ways and your doings. Then, and only then, I will permit you to dwell in this place. But, verse 4, trust you not in lying words, saying, the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God are these. On the one hand, verse 5, if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute justice between a man and his neighbor, then, indeed, it is the temple of God. If you oppress not the stranger, in verse 6, the fatherless, the widow, shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your heart, then I will permit you to dwell in this place. But that's not what you're doing. You trust in lying words that are of no avail. In verse 9, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, offer unto Baal, follow other gods whom you have not known, and come and stand before me in this house, whereupon my name is called, and say we are delivered, that when we do all these abominations? Note, again, this is where my name is called. You can connect with me here, but not by simply going through motions. There needs to be that inner process of transformation, of bend your ways. Is this house whereupon my name is called become a den of robbers in your eyes? And lest you think, it's okay, it's the temple of God after all. What could possibly happen to it? Continues the prophet, verse 12. For go you now unto my place which was in Shiloh, where I permitted my name to dwell at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says God, and I spoke unto you, speaking betimes and often, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto the house whereupon my name is called, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. When the temple becomes an end in itself, then as when we take anything in this world and make it an end in itself, we have made it, in effect, into an idol. The temple is means to connecting with God.
it's not an end in itself. This attitude of the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God, nothing can go wrong. The temple will be destroyed. The idol will be withdrawn. If you think you can simply use it and be vindicated, you don't deserve to have the temple in your midst. And indeed, this becomes a recurrent theme. How we need to relate to the temple, how we are forbidden to relate to the temple. The warning in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 17, guard your foot when you go to the house of God and be ready to hearken. Otherwise, don't go. In the prophecy of Hosea, in chapter 8, verse 13, indeed, a theme very similar to what we read in Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 21. Jeremiah says, add your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat you flesh. Likewise, Hosea, as to the sacrifices that are made by fire unto me, let them slaughter flesh and eat it. If you're interested in the sacrifices, go and have a barbecue. Worthless, meaningless, simply an exercise in your own narcissism because you're not using it as means to connecting with God and godliness. In verse 14, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built temples. And ironically, building temples is not means for connecting with God. On the contrary, it becomes a smokescreen for forgetting about God. And so the prophet Malachi in chapter 1, verse 10, seeks someone who have the gumption to just get up and shut the doors, shut the doors of the temple, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain, because it's completely meaningless. Likewise, the prophet Amos, in words that are very reminiscent of those of Isaiah chapter 1, I hate, I despise your feasts, I will take no delight in your solemn assemblies, unless, and this is crucial, Verse 24, but let justice well up as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Similarly, in the words of Psalms, in Psalm 40, in verse 7, sacrifice and meal offering, you have no desire for. What are you seeking of us? I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your Torah, your teaching, is in my inmost parts. Likewise, in Psalm 51, King David realizes you desire not sacrifice. You have no pleasure in birth offering. Rather, verse 19, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite, crushed heart you will not despise. Similarly, recurrent theme, in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 15, in verse 8, as opposed to the sacrifice of the wicked, which is an abomination, the prayer of the upright is God's will. In Proverbs chapter 21, similarly, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And that really is the message, recognizing what is the means and what necessarily is the end. What's crucial is our first meeting this basic requirement, humanity, as a prerequisite of becoming godly. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I desire kindness and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And you know, returning to Isaiah chapter 1, we considered the powerful words of rebuke over worthless offerings being brought by people 
who were corrupt, whose hands were full of blood. Is there a solution? Is there a way of, way of healing them? Of course. Verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed, judge for the fatherless, plead for the widow. And then the promise, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. There's a way back. But not if you think the temple is an end in itself. It's not. And this, of course, is crucial when we consider what altogether the temple is to signify for us. What does it teach us? What does it do? More than anything else, it provides us with the means to connect with God. But only when we indeed see it as the means to connect with God, not as an end in itself, not as mere ritual and ceremony, but the basis of the connection. And the basis of the connection, not only for Israel, for Israel in projecting a light to the entire world and thus for the entire world, in the next chapter in Isaiah, words we've discussed on many occasions, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the end of days, the, the mountain of God's house shall be established at the top of mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall stream unto it. The realization that it's not really the focal point for Israel, what we already saw after all in the prayer of dedication of King Solomon, in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 41 through 43, it's for everyone. Verse 3, and many peoples will go and say, go you and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will go on his paths. For out of Zion, Zion, remember, is the temple mount, will go forth Torah instruction, teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. And it is specifically in the wake of that, in verse 4, that he shall judge between the nations and reprove many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into burning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. We've discussed this many times, but it always bears stressing again and again the recipe for universal peace and brotherhood. It's not making some kind of a compromise because as long as my goal is to get one place and your goal is to get someplace else, then necessarily either I push you out of my way or you push me out of your way. And conflict is inexorable. What makes conflict vanish Indeed, what makes conflict absurd is when, before we get to verse 4, we really integrate verse 3, the universal realization that out of Zion goes forth Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. We recognize we all have one goal. Now, that's not because we become the same thing, because again, in verse 2, it was all the nations shall stream unto it, and they come as the nations. In verse 3, many peoples, as many peoples, they're not becoming Israel. There's no conversion here. But all of the nations come to this realization that out of Zion will go forth Torah, will go forth teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. All nations recognize there's only one goal. There are many missions to advance that goal, to reach that goal. But then once we realize there's only one goal, there's no conflict. I want you to advance in your mission as you want me to advance in my mission because the goal is fully actualized only as each of us in the unique pathway that God gives each of us advances toward that goal hand in hand 
together. Again, that's recognizing that Zion, the mountain of God's house, is a means to an end. It is indeed a means to an end for all of humanity. As we read, of course, likewise in Isaiah chapter 56, from verse 6 and on, it's not just about Israel, also the aliens that join themselves to God, to minister unto him, to love the name of God, to do, be his servants. Verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar, for my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Note, the essential identity of God's house is as a house of prayer, a house through which all peoples connect with God. Indeed, verse 8, thus says God, the Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel, yet I will gather others to him beside those of him that are gathered. Because ultimately, the temple becomes that focal point toward which everyone is ingathered. As we read in the final chapter of Zechariah, in chapter 14, in verse 16, after the final battle of the nations against God, fought here in Jerusalem. And it will come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to prostrate themselves before the king, the God of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. But again, that's in a world in which everyone recognizes the Holy Temple is means to an end. It's prostrating ourselves before the king, before the God of hosts. It's means to connecting with God and with godliness. Now, Zechariah talks about this happening once a year on the Feast of Tabernacles. I suppose that's a minimum because at the end of the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 66, when we read about that final conclusion of the world in which we live today, everyone's coming. And it's not just once a year. From verse 18, for I know their works and their thoughts, time comes that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will place a sign among them and will send refugees of them unto the nations. And there's a list of the nations, Tarshish, Pul, Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Yavan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my name, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Everyone will know. And they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for an offering unto God. Where? We know where. To my holy mountain, Jerusalem. And indeed, on that day, verse 21, of them also will I take for the priests and for the Levites, says God. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, says God, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, every month, every week, all the time, shall all flesh come to prostrate themselves before me, says God. Now again, when we conceive of what that means, of course, we're speaking of the rebuilt temple of the future. We're speaking of a world in which all of humanity, the entire world, appreciates there is indeed one goal. And the temple is merely means to getting to that goal. So inevitably, it's in this vein that we consider what the final message 
that emerges from this consecrated space is what indeed is the purpose of having a sanctuary on the one hand again it's means to god and godliness so those who aren't even behaving as human beings of course have no business coming into the temple becoming human first is the most basic prerequisite and maybe it is in that vein that we should consider in coming full circle what the placement of this command concerning the sanctuary signifies in exodus chapter 25. again the core of god's revelation is in exodus chapter 20. true in chapter 24 we read the conclusion of the revelation at sinai and that is why in chapter 25 we move on to the perpetuation of that bond with god on an ongoing basis but what happens between chapter 20 and here chapters 21 22 23 what are they all about we've discussed this elsewhere of course and admittedly we're not going to focus upon that now but to recall Exodus chapter 21 begins an extended discussion of the laws, the judgments, in particular, setting up a system of civil law that protects the weakest members of society. Because before you can get to any discussion of the Holy Temple, before you can get to Exodus chapter 25, you need to ensure that through the rules of civil society, through the behavior that you have engendered, you're going to behave like a human being. And all society will indeed be at minimum a human society Remember the words of Micha, to love justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with God. If you're not doing those, you haven't even begun. The process of establishing sacred space is first and foremost predicated upon that. And yet, of course, it's crucial for us to remember at the same time. While if you're not functioning like a human being, you haven't even begun. What if you have? You've established what we could describe as a humanistic society. You've begun, but you haven't finished. A humanist society is the prerequisite of becoming a godly society but it is not itself a godly society a godly society means establishing something more than that a godly society is being oriented with respect to the loftiest spiritual aspirations with which human beings are endowed It's predicated upon being human, but ultimately it's becoming, in a way, almost divine. By bringing that godliness into our lives, into our hearts, into our souls. It's in our hands because God enables us to do it. And the message of having a sanctuary, having a sacred place is we can take this world and make it into means to reaching God. Again, when we take anything in this world and regard it as the final end, we've ended the process. We've ended the process by making that end into our idol. But when we take the means 
we climb through it, sacred space becomes the means for being able to come to God. The Holy Temple is there for us all, beckoning us, we pray, to be able to restore that bond to God. If I can conclude with a little story, a true story, from a few years ago, that maybe provides a good illustration of this. As many of you may know, in 1929, the land of Israel was shaken by massive pogroms. Pogroms that, among others, completely annihilated the ancient Jewish community in the city of Gaza, that murdered around 60 people in the Jewish community of Hebron and set it on a trajectory that led in the next wave of pogroms to the end of that ancient community as well. Scores of dead. And after all of these pogroms had run their course, the British, who, as you may know, had the mandate over the land of Israel, convened a board of inquiry in order to determine whether the appropriate response would be to deny Jews rights of prayer at the Western Wall. Because after all, the Arabs were upset that the Jews were praying at the Western Wall, and that's why the Arabs were murdering the Jews. So maybe the best course would be to appease the murderers and deny the Jews rights of prayer at the Western Wall. And in the course of the deliberations of this board of inquiry, the chief rabbi of the Jewish community in the land of Israel, Rabbi Abraham Isaac HaKohen Cook, was called upon to testify. And one of the commissioners challenged him menacingly, isn't it true that you Jews want to build your temple where the Muslims have their mosques? And the rabbi responded calmly, when the time has come for the restoration of God's holy temple, the Muslims will be running ahead of us to disassemble their mosques in order to make room for God's temple restored. Not simply a clever tactical answer, but what we emphatically believe is God's truth. Because indeed, in the end of days, the mountain of God's house will be established at the head of mountains. In the end of days, all the nations will stream to it. And at the end of days, everyone will recognize that the greatest gift that God gives the world is the wherewithal for us all to come to him. And so, returning again to the beginning of our story and in its light, considering the end, there's this long drawn out process over the course of history. It's a process that arguably begins at Sinai, consecrated space. But it doesn't end there because Sinai, after all, is fleeting. The temple is forever. The means to connect with God in this world, the means to harness everything in this world as the wherewithal to come before him and by so doing to make the entire world and most of all, the greatest challenge to make ourselves godly, bastions of the divine. May we indeed appreciate this greatest blessing that God bestows upon us, the opportunity, the wherewithal, the faculty to establish this consecrated space, to appreciate the blessing in this charge, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. May we merit 
seeing that sanctuary restored and earn it being in our midst through our following this charge of God speedily in our days. God bless you.